Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 105, Dr. James Spiegel on The Making of an Atheist. Dr. James Spiegel is professor of philosophy and religion at Taylor University in Upland, Indiana. He earned his PhD in philosophy from Michigan State University in 1993, and he works in the areas of ethics and philosophy of religion. The author of many scholarly and popular articles and book chapters, his books include Hypocrisy, Moral Fraud and Other Vices, 1999, How to Be Good in a World Gone Bad, Living a Life of Christian Virtue, 2004, The Benefits of Providence, A New Look at Divine Sovereignty, 2005, and The Love of Wisdom, A Christian Introduction to Philosophy, co-authored with Stephen B. Cowan, 2009. He also blogs with his wife Amy at wisdomandfollyblog.com. But he's here today to talk with us about his 2010 book, The Making of an Atheist, How Immorality Leads to Unbelief. Dr. Spiegel, welcome to the Trinity's podcast. Thanks for having me. Dr. Spiegel, you've dedicated this book to Dr. Alvin Plantinga, a leading Christian philosopher now retired from Notre Dame. How does his theory of knowledge underlie your book? Well, Plantinga takes an approach to knowledge that takes seriously the cognitive conditions of the knower. It's not just a matter of uh, acquiring evidence and having your beliefs rightly supported by adequate evidence and so on. He, he also incorporates into his analysis the idea of the proper function of our belief forming mechanisms, our cognitive processes that, that give rise to the beliefs that we hold. And he notes that uh, like anything else about us as human beings, when we don't function properly with regard to our belief formation, you know, things can go awry and we can find ourselves believing things that aren't true. So he pays attention to ways in which our cognitive processes may be interfered with, ways that they might malfunction due to all sorts of factors. And some of the ways in which we malfunction cognitively are, say, when we're exposed to bad philosophical ideas, certain, say, cultural trends, that are inimical to a proper understanding of things and and also our moral spiritual condition. And he notes that sin is one of the important ways in which our cognitive faculties get hampered and uh, things can become so hampered by sin that we find ourselves even denying what should be clear to everyone regarding the reality of God and planning brings into play the whole concept of the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine that John Calvin and others referred to. It's a kind of natural awareness of God that, at least when our cognitive faculties are functioning properly, ultimately culminates in full-fledged belief in you know the reality of a creator who's actively involved in the world. But if our sin interrupts or impedes that development in our natural awareness of God, again, we may find ourselves either doubting the existence of God or arriving at the conclusion that there is no God. So those themes in Plantinga, I think, are correct. And I think it has profound implications for how we should think about atheism, hence my dedication of the book to him. So he views knowledge as true and warranted belief he thinks that your beliefs get warrant if they are formed by a well-designed and uh, well-functioning process of belief formation that's in the kind of environment for which it's designed. And so in this way, you might know, for instance, that you had Cheerios for breakfast because your memory is well-designed and functioning correctly in the right sort of environment. Of course, if you're drunk or you're super tired or you have some other cognitive malfunction that affects your memory, then you'll only believe certain things about the past but not know them. But so then he he believes that there's a cognitive belief forming unit that's built into us 
that concerns belief in God. And if it's working right, we can know that God exists even without having arguments to prove that God exists. And yet that faculty too is susceptible to damage from any number of factors. So this is not a typical theory of knowledge that a lot of uh, village atheists will accept. <laughs> Very often I find that they think that to know something, you ha it has to be something that can be directly experienced through the senses, or mm -hmm. possibly if you, the only way you can know something is if you can have an irrefutable argument in favor of it. Mm -hmm. But he just, he doesn't think about human knowledge in those ways. Do you think that that's correct? That human knowledge isn't limited by sense experience and doesn't require being able to argue for what you know? Yes, I think that's right. And I think it's demonstrable in many cases with regard to some, some of our more fundamental beliefs. You look at the history of Plantinga's scholarship when he launched these ideas back in the 60s with a book called God and Other Minds. Remember what was prevailing as a general epistemological perspective at that time was a pretty strong empiricism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just a couple decades following the, the advent of uh, the high point of logical positivism, you know, that had seeped into popular culture to the point that, um, you know, the, the burden of proof was now on the theist big time. And even in popular culture, you know, it's interesting how it was just a year prior to the release of that book that the famous Time magazine cover story came out, Is God Dead? The, the very next year, Plantinga publishes his book, God and Other Minds, where he challenges the assumption that was held by people like, you know, leading atheists, including Antony Flew, who was one of the leading atheists of the time. And for a long time, uh, probably one of the great atheist scholars of the 20th century, ironically, eventually recanted on his atheism 40 years later. But um, it was Plantinga's point uh, in that book to question this whole assumption that the burden of proof is on theists, right? That we should have, as Flew would eventually put it, a presumption of atheism and that uh, it's up to the theists to provide adequate evidence to overcome that, ideally empirical evidence. And Plantinga says, well, why accept that? After all, some of the most precious beliefs that we hold, and by that I mean beliefs that are fundamental, foundational, basic beliefs, not only are they not empirically arrived at, but it's really impossible to argue for them without somehow begging the question. So, you know, the classic example he gives is that of our belief in other minds, right? That these people that are walking around that look like me and noises come out of their face and they've got two arms and two legs just like me. For all of that, I don't have any experience of their private thoughts and feelings, nor can I give a conclusive argument demonstrating that they all have private thoughts and feelings. Yet I believe it, and I believe it about all the other billions of people on earth. So here I'm one case reasoning to billions of others. That's a notoriously bad inductive argument, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we all believe it. So it's a basic belief. It's not empirically arrived at. It's not argued to in any way philosophically or based on any evidence that's uh, irrefutable, it's really an article of philosophical faith. And there are many others. Our belief that every effect must have a cause, science is founded on that. The uniformity of nature, that the laws of nature will continue into the future. Science and common sense beliefs based on that, but we can't demonstrate it. My belief that my senses are generally reliable. You know, these are all things that you cannot argue for or give evidence for to support, you know, with some sort of philosophical or scientific argument. In fact, there are assumptions you make prior to acquiring any other knowledge that you gain, with the exception of, say, pure mathematics. <laughs> so if those are all beliefs to which I'm entitled as starting points, that shows that not only those beliefs, but all the other beliefs that we hold that are based on those things, all are founded on a kind of philosophical faith. It always amuses me when I hear, you know, some atheist or other say that, well, uh, or just a religious skeptic, you know, that I'm a person of faith and they're not. Well, 
if you understand faith in a kind of generic sense, or how about just the way that they're probably intending it as not rationally well-founded beliefs or beliefs that you can demonstrate the truth of with an argument, you know, that applies to the foundations of their belief system as well, no matter how rigorous they think they are in terms of their belief formation. Right. So when you say these commitments require faith, you're not saying that they're groundless or unreasonable. You're saying that they're not provable or uh, they're not infallible or something like that? Yeah, they're, they're not the conclusions of arguments that are, are based on evidence that uh, you know, we can acquire through the senses, say, or even through incorrigible beliefs or self-evident beliefs. There are assumptions that we make that precede all the other beliefs that we hold. Dr. Spiegel, you mentioned popular culture, and this ties in with my statement about naive empiricism often being assumed. I find that when I discuss the existence of God and related matters with some of the students in my Intro to Philosophy class, sometimes they will say something like, you can't have knowledge of that, that's not something tangible. I think they're taught this in elementary school to say, there's uh, tangible matters, and then there are matters of opinion. And obviously, this is just the second. And they seem to be thinking, well, there is no, no such thing as reasonable or unreasonable belief or knowledge in this kind of area. How do you respond to that kind of naive epistemology? My first response would be to note that it's self-refuting to say that, well, we don't have knowledge of you know, such intangible things. Well, do they know that? I mean, they mm. seem to be presenting that as a knowledge claim, and it's certainly, if it's knowledge, it's knowledge about something quite intangible. It's a, a claim about knowledge claims. It's, it's a pretty abstract concept. So how is it they came to that conclusion? And, you know, they certainly didn't arrive at it empirically. So uh, if they're going to claim to know that, if they're going to be able to, they think they can sustain that claim at all rationally, they're going to have to reject the very claim they're making. Yeah, I would cite to the example of moral knowledge that, mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at a right action and a wrong action. They may look, sound, smell the same, but you're utterly convinced that the one is wrong and the other is right. Yeah, that's the next step I take. That can be a little complicated, though, you know, if you have uh, a relativist in, your, in the room or somebody who's, you know, willing to, to challenge that and say that, you know, those are just preferences. Yeah. But, but most people do, after all, thankfully, believe that certain things are absolutely wrong. And you can appeal to that because they're certainly not empirically arrived at. Yeah. Dr. Spiegel, how would you explain the main thesis of this book? I guess I'd put it negatively, that atheism is not the result of a lack of evidence or a failure on God's part to make himself clearly enough known in creation and human experience such that, you know, everybody can see that it's so. If you want to put it positively, I suppose I'd say that the atheistic position is the product of, you know, to some degree, immorality. And I guess that's in the subtitle of the book, that uh, immorality somehow leads to unbelief. It figures in in some way the will is involved. It isn't just a pure, a purely rational matter, you know, where an atheist is reviewing the evidence and concludes that, well, after all, there is no God. There are volitional dimensions involved in the conclusion that there is no God. So it's a thesis about the origin of atheism. And by atheism or atheists, what do you mean by that? Often philosopher will mean somebody who denies that there is a God. 
Right. Well, there is a great variety of atheisms, just like there are different forms of theism. And in the book, I decided to settle on a, a very simple definition of atheism as uh, the denial of theism. And that's collapsing a number of different atheisms and some forms of agnosticism into you know, that category. And the reason I thought that worked for the sake of the book uh, is because you know, the biblical diagnosis, as I call it, applies to all forms of rejection of theism. But, you know, readers are certainly welcome to, uh, to nuance it, you know, however they want. But that's how I defined it in the context of the book. So if it's rejection of theism, then does that, 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 that doesn't mean just not believing theism, right? Um, so would an agnostic be an atheist here? Um, yeah, for the purposes of the book, I'm taking atheism to refer just to those who reject theism, those who disbelieve in a personal God. We could talk about agnosticism and degrees of, of doubt and so on, but for the purposes of my book, that's not really necessary. And you can apply my thesis to that whole phenomenon of doubt. But uh, yeah, I'm understanding atheism as a rejection of theism, a definite disbelief in God. The critique then doesn't apply directly to agnostics also? That would, that would be kind of a related matter? They're not included in the atheists? Yeah, of course, there are, <laughs> there are different degrees of agnosticism. And, you know, sometimes you'll hear agnostics describe themselves in terms that certainly sounds like they're not just doubting, but they rejecting theism. So I guess that would apply to those agnostics, whereas others, like a student I spoke with recently, his brand of agnosticism sounded a lot more like just a very unsure theism. <laughs> yeah, I think people do amateur etymology on the word. As far as I know, it was coined to mean somebody who doesn't believe in God and somebody who doesn't believe that there isn't a God. So they're just on the fence. Mm -hmm. if, if you say, does God exist? They just, well, I don't know. They're, they're not committed either way. But people look at the term and they see the alpha privative and then the word Gnostic, and they think it means somebody who doesn't know that God exists, but then maybe you believe that God exists, or maybe you believe there is no God, but you just don't want to say that you know it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says he's agnostic because it sounds too bold to say that there is no God, like he knows that, but he in fact believes that there is no God. Yeah, so for the agnostic... It's more like the classical version of that, sitting on the fence or undecided. They certainly are not a theist. So they're, in that sense, rejecting theism. So in my de the definition I use in my book, atheism would apply to them. But it wouldn't apply to babies. Correct, because they're not able to reject. Yeah, they're not able to consider the question really. Is the thesis then about the origin of atheism, is it, is it about all atheists or is it about most atheists, like adult, informed, mentally functional? How broadly do we mean it? If we accept the critique, would it apply to just anybody who believes that there is no God? That's correct. It's a, I intend it as a universal thesis for anybody who rejects the reality of God at any age, you know, so long as they're cognitively functional enough to, to make that rejection. I think there are some cases are more extreme than others in terms of willful rejection of God. My thesis really focuses particularly on, you know, the whole idea of cognitive malfunction. And for some people, it may be less willful there, there than for, for others. But I do think the will is involved in, to some degree in every case. So it looks like theism, you know, it looks differently for, for different people, but I do think that there's always some volitional dimension in any case. When I was talking about this issue with Dr. Randall Rouser an episode or two ago, I raised this idea to ask him about the most extreme view would be that atheists actually do believe that God exists or even know that God exists. And yet they're just, you know, lying about it. Is that how your critique goes? Or is it some, something less that they, not, not necessarily that they believe it, but 
Hmm. Yeah, I think that's how it goes for some or many atheists. But I do believe that for others, you don't have that kind of self-deception. Uh, there can be sincere disbelief in God, but that disbelief is a result of cognitive malfunction where sin is involved somehow. And I think I've had you know conversations with you know plenty of atheists who would fall into that category. Then again, I've had conversations with with many former atheists who would describe themselves in those really strong terms that, you know, I was lying to myself or I knew God was there all along. I just didn't want to accept this. It was a kind of suppression of that belief or that truth that I was aware of because I didn't want to, you know, fill in the blank. You know, in many cases, it's, you know, I didn't want to acknowledge that I was going to be accountable to anyone for my lifestyle someday, that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, that, that strong definition does apply to some, but not all. In your terms, you, you talk about the phrase from John Calvin, the sensus divinitatis or awareness of God. So is your view then that there's a sliding scale of kind of how aware people are of God and that any atheist is going to be aware to some small degree at least? You know, I would extend that even farther and say that, yes, there's a sliding scale, there's a spectrum from, you know, outright denial of what they, they know is true all the way to a very vague awareness anymore. And then even farther than that to a loss of an awareness altogether. If that census divinitatis has been so damaged, as Plantinga would put it, by sin, by cognitive malfunction, you know, in, in that uh, subcategory, they might lose all awareness in, of God and then very honestly say, I see no evidence of God or reason at all to believe that God exists. So I, I think it can be that extreme. In that case, then, those atheists are speaking very sincerely when, when they say, I honestly don't see any reason to believe in God, and I genuinely don't think there is a God. I, I think they're being perfectly forthright, even if some other atheists are not. Dr. Spiegel, it's been about five years since your book was published. What's been the response from Christians and from atheists? Well, starting with uh, Christians, well, I haven't encountered many Christians who disagree with my thesis, but I'm sure they're out there like Randall Rouser and I, I think Chad Meister, who's uh, you know, a philosopher up at uh, Bethel College in northern Indiana, you know, first-rate thinker and philosopher. I think he takes exception uh, to my thesis and they're sure plenty of others, but um, those Christians that at least I've conversed with and had online discussions with who used to be atheists, all consider my thesis to be correct. And sometimes emphatically, you know, I've declared that, you know, I really nailed it. And I, it describes their mindset before they came to believe. So I think that's significant. As for atheists and, you know, others who aren't Christians and their response, it's been, you know, generally a negative response, but a range there. Some have been <laughs> extremely hostile. I've gotten some, in some cases, very profane email messages from people I don't know. Uh, they're frankly kind of scary. And then others that range all the way to, you know, very cordial responses from atheists who just want to understand what I'm saying. And I've, I've found that those who are patient enough to, to hear me out you know, conclude by saying, well, okay, this, this really helps. And um, this is, it makes more sense to me. I don't ag agree, but you know, I, I, I can see why someone in your worldview would, 
would take that stance. And I'm in currently in conversation with uh, an atheist in Texas who's who contacted me recently. We've had some really good email dialogue that I think is constructive. So it might be surprising to to some critics of my thesis that it can actually generate constructive dialogue, but it has. Dr. Spiegel, how would you respond to what I'm guessing are some readers who think that you're dismissing atheists or that the book is just an attack against them and a way to avoid any intellectual arguments that they bring on behalf of atheism or against belief in God? Yeah, I certainly don't intend it in that way. I actually would hope that you know an open-minded atheist would read my book in such a way as to take seriously at least the idea that it's possible that they could be mistaken to the point that they would do a kind of inventory of their own life and experience and consider that, well, maybe this is an accurate diagnostic. And I think, uh, you know, the same is true for theists. You know, when I hear atheistic arguments, not just critiques of theistic arguments, but, you know, positive arguments against God, problem of evil, I take those seriously. And I would hope that atheists would similarly take seriously the arguments not only against atheism, but that would potentially diagnose their incorrect belief. And just as, again, theists have often, and I think should take seriously, the theories of a Feuerbach or a Freud or, or others who actually give a kind of psychological explanation for <laughs> for why theistic belief emerges as mistaken as they claim it is. So I would hope this would contribute to the conversation and um, be one more avenue or um, occasion for atheists to reconsider their view. And I think that just the sheer numbers regarding the situation in terms of the predominance of theistic belief would reinforce this. You know, the vast majority, 90% plus of the human population believes in some sort of higher power or God, so that if somebody's deluded, right, if somebody's subject to some sort of delusion, which I guess you could take my thesis as claiming that about, about atheists, that makes for a pretty grim view of human beings to say that 90% plus of the population is, is, is a victim of this delusion, this psychological delusion, as uh, Richard Dawkins would put it. Is it more likely that that's the case, or is it more likely that only you know ten percent of the population are subject to a kind of you know delusion or psychological malfunction? I'm claiming that it's just the ten percent. Richard Dawkins and some others have claimed that it's the ninety percent majority, and I, I do think that is a by far a much more grim assessment of the human cognitive condition. Dr. Spiegel, you mentioned Freud and his famous critique in his book, The Future of an Illusion, where he tries to argue that people believe in God just based on wishful thinking. The universe is a scary place and they they feel this need for a heavenly parent. And this is supposedly where all belief in God comes from. And it's funny you should mention that I actually teach this in my own introduction to philosophy class, as discussed in an article by the famous atheist philosopher William Rowe who's actually one of my favorite recent philosophers, even though I'm not an atheist. And, you know, I, I'm happy to submit to consider this. And uh, even though it would sort of look, it would reflect poorly on me if it was true and, and on all theists. And in your book in the middle, this isn't part of your main thesis, but you bring up some discussions by psychologists and others 
of atheism as being due to people who in some sense are fatherless or people who have a very particularly sexually immoral lifestyle. And so, for instance, you mentioned books that discuss Rousseau, Shelley, Marx, Ibsen, Tolstoy, Hemingway, Russell, Sartre. And it strikes me that these are kind of public atheist figureheads. And and you mentioned Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. And these are not even just the village atheist type of person, but they're the fire-breathing uh, Samson of... <laughs> Uh, not Samson, uh, the giant. What's the name I'm looking for? Goliath. Goliath. Yeah, they're the fire-breathing Goliath of the <laughs> atheist community. And of course, they're very aggressive and even just pissed at, you know, religion and religious people. And they're just offended by the idea of God and so on. But I wonder if the critique in, that you offer, and maybe some of these other critiques, these psychological theories, I wonder if some of these critiques apply more to the public atheist figurehead than they do just for the garden variety naturalist. Say, a kid in the ninth grade in Sweden who just hasn't seen theism being taken very seriously, hasn't looked into it that much, but doesn't seem particularly opposed to God just sort of is going on the unexamined assumption that God is not really relevant to modern thinkers or something like that. Yeah, I think the, you know, consideration of, say, Paul Vitz's research and Faith of the Fatherless and, you know, what people like Paul Johnson and E. Michael Jones have done in their books, Intellectuals and Degenerate Moderns, you know, focusing on the Goliaths, as you say, of culture in terms of atheism, that certainly powerfully demonstrates something about or illustrates at least the uh, influence of certain factors, psychological and moral, when it comes to religious or theistic belief formation. But it, it takes more, is, and this is the point you're making, I think implicitly, and it's a good one, that it takes more than that to justify a, a universal thesis about, about atheism. And that's why I think we need a theological buttress point as well. And that's you know, what we find in Romans 1 and Ephesians 4 and in Scripture that there's a kind of universal claim regarding the you know, suppression of, of the truth of God that, that Paul seems to be making in, in Romans 1 that, that would extend it even to that young man in Sweden or to some of my colleagues who used to be atheists but were not really militant about it. They just found themselves not believing in God. And, you know, there one in particular who uh, is a friend of mine uh, computer scientist. He, he said before he was a, a Christian, you know, he was, he was a faithful husband. He was a, a, a good dad. He was a very moral person. And uh, there are lots of atheists like that. In fact, the, the, the guy I've been having the email conversation with lately in, in Texas is like that. Um, and so there's nothing fire breathing there. They, I mean, their lives are characterized by a lot of Christian virtues. So What's going on there? I think that Paul's words in Romans 1 still apply to them. The suppression by wickedness, though, looks a lot different than it would in the cases of some of these other folks who are more renowned <laughs> for their rebellion. So at, at any rate, I, I think when you bring the, the, the biblical evidence into it, you can extend it to a universal thesis. When you say the suppression of evidence takes different forms you have in mind that maybe it manifests as pride or self-righteousness rather than as loud denunciations and denials yes exactly and i i think that is one of the things i've had to clarify to a number of atheists that you know arrogance or abject pride are sins and can be very disruptive cognitively when it comes to theistic belief or a proper perception of the evidence for God. And certainly before I was a person of faith, <laughs> um, that pride kept me from embracing the truth. And that pride still is quite alive in me as it is in every human being descended from Adam, right? That, you know, we, we would like to be the completely autonomous and uh, not accountable to anyone uh, I just think in some cases that factor combined often with other things ultimately results in 
in the rejection of God. Dr. Spiegel, in his recent book, Is the Atheist My Neighbor?, evangelical theologian and apologist Dr. Randall Rouser discusses what he calls the rebellion thesis. And this is in his words, quote, while atheists profess to believe that God does not exist, this disbelief is the result of an active and culpable suppression of an innate disposition to believe in God, which is born of a hatred of God and a desire to sin with impunity, end quote. And so he critiques that rebellion thesis and argues against it on the basis that the scriptures don't support it and on uh, the basis of experience. Is the rebellion thesis what you're defending? I suppose some version of it, but much softer than, than that. You know, I wouldn't say it's always active, intentional kind of suppression. I, I think it, it can be very, and often is, subconscious. I don't think it's necessarily born of this desire to sin with impunity. So there are aspects of that particular version of the rebellion thesis that I would reject, but it would still be a form of the rebellion thesis because I do believe that the evidence is there for all to see or all to experience in nature that there is a God, uh, as Paul says in, in Romans 1, to the point where, as he puts it, no one has an excuse. And not even those who have uh, a sense or two subtracted. There's this interesting story about Helen Keller that I read once where she talks about when she first learned the word God. And here's a, a lady who could not see, could not hear, had no memory of being able to see or hear. And she learns the name God. How Ann Sullivan taught that to her, <laughs> that and so many other things. Um, I'll never know. I consider that one of the greatest accomplishments, maybe the greatest accomplishment of the 20th century, and Sullivan teaching Helen Keller to speak and read and even write. So Helen Keller reported how when she learned the name of God, it was exhilarating for her because now, as she put it, now I knew the name for him that I'd known all along. Well, that's remarkable. You know, she didn't have any recollection of seeing trees, and the blue sky, and uh, flowers, and human faces, and all the beauty around us uh, visually, nor did she recall hearing all the beautiful sounds that we can hear around us. And yet she knew that God was there. And I think that's a powerful confirmation of, you know, Calvin's idea of the sensus divinitatis. It seems to be implanted in us. And she was responsive. So she was a theist all along, even though it took her a while to finally learn the name of God. Dr. Spiegel, thanks for talking with us. Thank you. Today's thinking music has been It's Always Too Late to Start Over by Chris Zabriskie from his album Direct to Video. You can hear that whole track or download it at the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. Did you hear anything on today's episode that you thought was insightful or moving? Can you think of anyone who might benefit from hearing this episode? If so, would you consider sharing this episode on social media or even by email? Next week's episode will again feature Dr. Spiegel, this time discussing some famous Bible passages that deal with atheism and also with the benefits of theism. <laughs>
for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.